Welcome to Taste of Messiah. This is another taste. Uh, today's taste is actually coming from the Torah portion, Chachat, which is the ordinance of the red heifer. And when we go through this Torah portion, we will actually find the crucifixion uh, alluded to at least three times. There may be more, but I'm only going to talk about three of those times. So this tells us that we need to search and find Yeshua because he really is revealing himself to those who are truly seeking him. So in Numbers chapter 19, verse 1, Now Yahweh spoke to Moshe and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law, which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish in which there is no defect on and in which has never had a yoke. Now many believers today would wonder why would we even need to study this? Can I even bring a sacrifice? Or why do I need to bring this offering? And the answer is not about doing this command as much as it is about what this command teaches us and how it is Yeshua. The red heifer was the only sacrifice that was specifically required to be an animal of a certain color. This animal was very rare and of unique kind. Mamedes wrote nine red heifers were prepared from the time of the command was given until the destruction of the second temple. Moses prepared one, Ezra prepared one, and seven more were prepared until the destruction of the temple. The tenth will be prepared by Mashiach. But as believers, we know he has already been the sacrifice, and therefore there has already been ten of these sacrifices. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, And so it was written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man... Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spirit is not first, but natural, and after, afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also those who are made of dust. And as the heavenly man, so also those who are heavenly. So if you know or will come to know Yeshua as Lord, you will become a heavenly being. And as we have been born in the image of man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now the red heifer was the only sacrifice where all the rituals were carried on outside the camp and later outside the temple precincts. That is the blood applications of this sacrifice occurred in a location apart from the altar. Now, the Talmud recounts of the high priest performed the blood applications of the red heifer while gazing at the temple and at the Holy of Holies from a mountain opposite the temple. Now, of course, we know that the temple was setting on Mount Moriah. So an, a mountain opposite of that would, of course, be the uh, Mount all of it. And in this picture, uh, well, actually, before I tell you that picture, there's this picture that you see of right now in Israel, and they have been doing this for several years now, looking for a red heifer, for this red heifer sacrifice, so that they can, uh, you know, purify the temple when it's built. And you notice this uh, rabbi is actually using a magnifying glass, a very strong magnifying glass, to see if there's any blemishes or any other colored hairs on this, uh, this red heifer here. So then we go on, and as I just was talking about, here is the mountain of olives looking towards the Temple Mount. And we see in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, Therefore Jesus also, that he might be sanctified the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go before him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So we, um, we know, in other words, that as followers of Yeshua, we have no city on this earth 
uh, really for us to dwell. We're looking for that heavenly city, that heavenly Jerusalem to come down. Now, that pretty much concludes this first picture, this first sacrifice, and how you see how Yeshua could have looked right into the holy place, and perhaps right before or during his death, and when the uh, veil was rent in two, perhaps he could have seen inside. But regardless, the point is, once he died and rose from the dead, now the way has been made for us to enter boldly before the throne of God. Now, I want to go to the second example. So, the first time Moses was told to strike the rock, and that was at Meribah, in the, in the book of Exodus, it talks about this, how the children of Israel didn't have water to drink, and so Moses was told by the Lord to strike the rock. And this striking the rock was foreshadowing Yeshua being struck. And then this event happens again here in Numbers, in this uh, Torah portion of Chachat, and in this time, the Lord says, only speak to the rock. And But we know that what happens is Moses, well, let's just read. Uh, in Numbers chapter 20, verse 8, and he says, the Lord says, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses, Moses took the rod from before Yahweh as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bear water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck. So that was Exodus 17, 6. The rock twice with his rod, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation and the animals drank. Now Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with Yahweh, and he was hallowed among them. So again, the first time, as we said in Exodus chapter 17, verse 6, Moses was told to strike the rock. But the second time, in Numbers, he was told simply to speak to the rock. And the picture is, first of all, Yeshua had to be struck. He had to be crucified so that you could be redeemed. And then now you can speak to him. You can speak to the Lord because of Yeshua's crucifixion. It's a beautiful thing. And, but, but because Moses disobeyed, but in his disobedience, he painted for us the picture of how we come before the Lord. Now we go on in Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. <clears throat> and it says, Then they journeyed from Mount, Mo Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And so the people spoke against Moses and and God, and they asked, Why have you brought us out of the Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and there's no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Now keep in mind, this worthless bread they're talking about was the manna from heaven, and in Psalms it talks about this manna as actually being the very food of angels. That's a very much uh, bad thing to say, wouldn't you think? So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for you have spoken against the Lord and against you. Because, but So pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. So now, I want you to see something very amazing. This is a, a, a an, an image that was made actually by a, um, an Italian artist. Uh, and it's the picture of the serpent on the pole that Moses uh, would have made. And this statue 
is actually on the top of Mount Nebo, which is the place where Moses viewed the land uh, and when he couldn't go in to the land. And down right straight below, you can't really make it out in the picture because of the haze of that day. And it usually is like that, honestly. But that would have been Jericho. And then on further, if it would be a clear day, you could see Jerusalem. So from this vantage point, Moses viewed all of the land that God had promised to the Israelites. And isn't it amazing that this would be the marker of that place, this, this pole with a serpent on it, as God said. And this was a picture of Israel's redemption. And all they had to do was look at it. Just look at it, and they would be healed. And do you know there would be some there that wouldn't even believe enough to look up and be healed. They would rather be rebellious and not look upon the cross. And that's the way it is even today. The cross is there. If you will submit your heart to the cross and the work that Yeshua did for you on the cross, that he gave his life on that cross to pay for every one of the sins of the whole world, and then was buried after his death for three days, and then on the third day rose, resurrected from the grave, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. If you can believe that God did that, the Lord says you will be saved. So, let's go back to the red heifer. Uh, without blemish, morally and, morally and physically sound, in which there is no defect. Remember when we read that earlier, that this red heifer could not have any defect. So look at the, one of the tenets in, that we find in Luke chapter 23 and verse 4. It says, Then Pilate, to the chief priests and to the people, said, I find no fault in this man, speaking of Yeshua. Even though they brought, the Jewish leaders brought Yeshua to be judged by Pilate, the Roman governor, he said he found no fault in him. Also, in John chapter 19, verse 6, when the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, Take you him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And so, you see, that's two witnesses, but there's many, many more. But then the beautiful thing for us is found in Jude chapter 1, verse 24. Now to him, and that him, of course, is the Lord, Yeshua, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his presence of his glory with exceeding joy to our God, our Yeshua, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both right now and forevermore. Amen. So we also know that this uh, red heifer would, would have talked about not ever having a yoke placed on it. And wouldn't you know, Yeshua comes along and says, take the yoke of Yeshua. And he says, what is the yoke of Yeshua? And he, you, when you're saved, you are his yoke and you are his burden. For he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that same word for uh, yoke uh, or burden is shevarim, which means friend. So you are his friend and you're also his yoke. He wants to wear you around his neck and carry your burdens for you. Yeshua wants to take your burdens. It says in Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. And also in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Your reward is directly proportionate to your willingness to serve him. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all, which it says in Mark chapter 10, verse 44. And then in verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And finally, in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 8, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost, for the excellence of the knowledge of Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, 
and count them as rubbish that I may gain Messiah Yeshua. I pray that you know him. And if you do, strive today. Ask him for more of his presence, more of his filling of his sweet Holy Spirit. And if you don't know him, ask him today into your life. Be forgiven, be saved, be redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, of the one who was lifted up so that all man could be saved.